Hey, how's it going everyone? My name is Brandon Clements and welcome back to another video here on Glass Hand. And today I'm super excited because we're going to be talking about uh, more of a beginner topic. What's the difference between a static mesh and a skeletal mesh? And I'm actually going to walk through how to import the two different types, why you would want to use them. And also we're going to look at the city sample kit, um, the project today for the matrix demo, just to have a really cool backdrop for these Gundams that we're going to import and start working with. So let me show you those files real quick. So right here, uh, this is going to be our static mesh uh, example. So I got this uh, from the Sketchfab plugin that you can download using Blender. And uh, thanks to the artists uh, who have provided this for a free download, I'll put those links in the description box below. So you guys can download these projects and, and tweak them and have fun with them like I did. Uh, so this is going to be our static mesh and this is going to be our skeletal mesh. And you can see that I have generated a rig for this uh, Gundam and uh, it's working really well. And I'm using Auto Rig Pro, which I've used in prior videos before, but I highly recommend that you guys buy this add-on. Uh, it's not that expensive and man, it will save you a ton of time when creating these uh, skeletal meshes. So here we have our static mesh example, and you can see on the right-hand side, there is basically a group object, just a non-renderable, like null object with uh, a bunch of different children underneath of them. And the way that this is going to come into Unreal Engine is there's going to be around uh, 68 different mesh objects. And sometimes you can't avoid this. Sometimes this just has to be this way. So I'm gonna show you um, how to get this in there super simply. So the only thing we're going to do is just, uh, we're gonna select everything. We're gonna go to File, Export, and we're gonna do an FBX. And here I'm gonna just tick on Selected Objects. I like to use Selected Objects in this kind of workflow because sometimes you may have a scene in your DCC that has all the different types together. Um, so you can just export the ones that you want that are selected. I'm gonna go into my exports folder and uh, you can see here that I'm gonna name this Red Gundam. And I'm gonna leave everything pretty much the same here. Um, you know what, you can do this uh, to make sure that your process is going to be one-to-one -one, um, from Blender to Unreal Engine. Let me show you those manual settings. So for the forward axis, you're going to want to use negative X and you're going to want to use Z up because both of these softwares, the Z axis points up. And then in the armature settings, you would just want to flip these around to X and Y. Uh, now later on, when we actually export our skeletal mesh, we'll use some presets from AutoRig Pro that will kind of take care of this for you. But if you're doing it manually, uh, this should get your transforms in the correct um, space as Unreal Engine. Okay, so let's go ahead and replace that red Gundam. And we're gonna jump back over to Unreal. And I have a folder here for my static meshes. And I also have a material folder. And I went ahead and to save some time, just got our materials uh, set up for us. Yes, you will have to, uh, through the FBX process, set up your own materials. Um, that kind of sucks going back and forth between different software, but it kind of is what it is. And uh, it's not too bad once you go in there and start setting them up. So the uh, red Gundam, that's what we're gonna choose here. And for this dialog box, we're going to choose build Nanite. Uh, this is not a skeletal mesh, so we can utilize Nanite for our static mesh. And we're gonna keep everything pretty much the same here because our static mesh is just something that is a, um, an object that's not going to move in our scene. It's basically just artwork that looks really nice. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to say, do not create materials. And we don't have any textures to import. So we're going to go ahead and say import all and let that think for just a moment. Okay. And after that process is done, we do get some warnings. Uh, we can say it says no smoothing group information was found. Um, so if we wanted to fix this error, it's pretty simple. Let me show you what you can do. Um, inside of Blender. We're going to go to export one more time. We're going to go to FBX. And then when we go down to geometry, we're going to set this to face. Okay. And we're going to do negative X, Z. Everything's pretty much the same. And let's go ahead and try that one more time. And the, uh, the good thing about this is that you can re-import all of these 
pieces of mesh that you can see that showed up here. So, um, and also note that there's a little asterisk here. That means these have not been saved yet. So if Unreal was to crash at this point, it would not show up again in the content browser. So you have to make sure that you save so that these will always be here for you uh, when you come back. Um, so let's go ahead and right click. Um, sorry, not right click. We're going to shift click everything here from the first to the last. And we're going to say uh, re-import. And this is going to run through and re-import everything with our updated changes with our normals. So we went back to Blender, and when it said normals only, we changed that to face. So that will help us um, have a better representation of the normals inside of Unreal Engine. And they'll look pretty much the same as they did in Blender. Okay, so that process finished, and uh, we can see that in our log that we have no errors in our message log, so that's good. Um, but one thing is wrong, we don't have the materials applied. So um, let me pull this over from my other screen to show you. Um, yellow armor mat, well we do have a yellow armor mat. By the way, I'm using control space to pop open the content browser. We do have a yellow armor mat, so why wasn't that applied to here? I would love if this just came in with this applied. Well. It's pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to come back to our static mesh folder here, go into our materials. Let's just drag this, all these materials into the directory that we're going to import our meshes into. Okay. So let's go ahead and try this one more time with our materials showing up in the right place. And if you want to, another quick tip is under filter. Um, which is this icon here, you can tick some of these filters. Uh, you can see here I have animation sequence, blueprint, material, skeletal mesh, static mesh, and static mesh foliage. Uh, this will just show you only the things that you're willing to see. So static mesh, um, I can hit control A, and I can do a save operation here, or I can go ahead and do the re-import function. Uh, I want to show you one other thing. If you go to the editor preferences and bring up this dialog box and then type in re-import, you're going to find a show import dialog box at re-import. So if you want this to come back up, you can turn it on. Otherwise, when I right click and re-import, I won't see those same um, options that we had when we first imported this FBX. So just wanted to mention that if you want to see those again, you can turn them on in your project set or sorry, your editor settings. Let's go ahead and hit re-import one more time. Okay. So we did our re-import and you can see that the materials were not applied. So let's try this one more time. Uh, what I'm going to do is do something a little bit counterintuitive. I'm going to go ahead and delete these objects and I'm going to do a import this uh, red Gundam one more time and we're going to build nanite and we're also just going to uh, do not create materials do not import textures our search location uh, is going to be all assets okay the bad thing about the re-import dialog box when you do um, do this after the initial import is you do not get this material rollout setting um, you do not get any of these options. Any, this is only appearing when you first import the mesh. So let's go ahead and try this one more time. Okay, so you can see that that worked. Um, it is a pain. Um, you do not get those re-import settings. Let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, if I go ahead and click re-import, I have my editor preferences to say, come back up when you re-import, show me those dialog options. And you can see that you do not have those anymore. So you do have to, sadly, um, delete it from the project, re-import it. Um, I know that's not the best case scenario for a lot of the projects, but I can show you um, in our next step how to make your life a little bit easier. Um, because if you just had everything selected and you drag this into your project, like so, whenever you delete this guy, whenever you delete it, 
right here from the content browser, it will take it out of the level. It will absolutely just delete it out of the level. So one way that you can get around that, um, one second, let me just delete our Gundam actor here. So I'm just searching for Gundam. And we'll go ahead and delete. Okay, cool. So one way you can get around that is by creating a blueprint class. So I'm gonna to go to actor and I'm gonna say blueprint underscore SM for static mesh and I'm just gonna call this red Gundam. Okay, and right before we continue, let's go ahead and move our materials back into our materials folder because I'm OCD like that. <laughs> we gotta make sure everything's kind of nice and clean, okay? So now we'll go back into our uh, blueprint and we're going to tick on static mesh here. I'm going to hit control A and I'm going to drag everything into this blueprint and you can see, wow, uh, it is super bright in here. So let's go ahead and compile and save. And then we can just drag that class back into the level. So now if we ever needed to, again, get around that issue where you needed to update these materials again, it's in a blueprint class. So everything is kind of housed inside of here, even though there's no logic or anything happening in here. Um, let me go ahead and turn this to unlit. Even though there's no logic that's happening here, you can still contain everything within these static mesh components. And that way, if you needed to delete something or re-import something, uh, you can contain it within this Blueprint class. So let's do that uh, as a test really quick. Let's go ahead and delete all these things. It's going to, of course, yell at us. And uh, a word of warning here, uh, this could potentially, if you delete it, I'll show you the dialog box here soon. But if you delete it while it's in a blueprint, you could potentially crash the software because those references are going to be lost and it could produce a bunch of errors. Um, so once this delete assets comes back up, I'll show you exactly what I mean. Okay, so we get a warning here and it says, hey, uh, assets referencing the depending deleted assets. So um, it's basically saying all of these meshes that you're trying to delete are in this blueprint. Are you sure you want to do this? Um, they're still referenced in memory, and if you delete them, it could potentially crash the software. So you could replace those references uh, with other static meshes. You could try and force delete it. Or what you could do is do the safest route and uh, just come back into here. And we're just going to delete the static mesh components from here, which is totally safe. We'll go ahead and compile and save. Our transform is still saved in our scene, which is great. And we'll come back into the static meshes, delete those. And I'm gonna go ahead and re-import those one more time. So I'll cut to make this quicker. I'm gonna do import red Gundam. We're gonna come down to our materials. We're gonna say do not create and uh, search all of our assets and don't import textures. Just search for everything and, and try to apply them if you do find them. Okay, and as long as everything is named the same, uh, we're going to have good results. I'm going to save this real quick and open up the blueprint function. Or I should say just the blueprint class. Grab all of our static meshes, throw them in here, compile, save, and there you go. So, uh, moral of the story, <laughs> I guess, is blueprints are amazing. Uh, don't feel like you have to know coding or that you have to put some logic into it. They can just be containers in your level. Um, and you know, these are great. These save a ton of time, especially if you're working on a team where you're not doing like a waterfall type of workflow where someone could be working on something else and you're developing the level and layout. You can just throw things into blueprint classes. Um, you can also harvest objects, um, from the scene. So let's say I wanted to make this a blueprint. Um, you could actually come up to the uh, little blueprint thing 
and then say convert selection to blueprint class. So uh, these are all just tips here. Um, I'm hoping, you know, you guys as beginners who are just getting into Unreal Engine um, are seeing ways that you can put these modular pieces together and just create, um, uh, you know, just easier ways for your life, you know, just make life easier, right? That's what we want to do. Um, so if you come over and look at the triangles in the Nanite view, you can see that our static mesh is indeed a Nanite mesh. Um, and just as a rule of thumb, if you're using virtual shadow maps, Lumen, you, you want to use Nanite uh, in pretty much everything. So even from the tiniest little uh, polygon all the way up to sculpts, like high resolution digital sculpts, you're, you're going to want everything in your scene to utilize Nanite because those other te technologies that I mentioned, virtual shadow maps and Lumen, they all depend on one another. So it's just a, a great idea just to use uh, Nanite for everything, really, as long as you can get away with it. Now, there are some caveats. You know, we are in 5.1 right now. So Nanite can be used for foliage in masked materials, masked shaders, and two-sided foliage. So that stuff works. Um, but you cannot use nanite with translucent materials. So things like glass, a glass sculpture, something like that, where you have to actually see through an object. Um, at the record, at the time of this recording, you cannot use nanite for those types of things. Okay. And, uh, what is nanite? If, for those who are asking, um, nanite is a way to, um, get away from LODs back in the day, GPUs, really struggled at drawing super tiny triangles from far away. And so uh, as I move up in forward and back, you can start to see these triangles are popping in and changing. Every single color is a different triangle. Uh, so this alleviates the need of doing LODs. So we just don't have to worry about that anymore. You can just import your static mesh and the uh, screen resolution and Unreal Engine 5 will just take care of the overshading um, that we used to run into a long time ago. So yeah, as you can see these trees, you get up close, you move far away, it's gonna take care of all of that for you. There is one more option that I wanna show you while we're talking about Nanite, uh, especially with trees. Uh, this is actual geometry here for the trees. Uh, there is a attribute called preserve area. And this preserve area is good for um, canopies of trees as you move farther back they may be cold and you want to enable that to keep the canopies from really far away so your leaves don't uh, get cold essentially um, some of these other settings here are worth mentioning this uh, fallback relative error you can put this at zero if you decide to use some ray tracing techniques uh, this will make sure that the nanite fallback mesh will be as detailed as the regular nanite mesh, so you won't see any weird shadow artifacts. Um, also, something to note, this minimum residency, uh, if you're spawning objects in and out in your game, uh, you might want to increase the memory limit here for really important meshes. Uh, this will just make sure that there's no artifacts when it pops in. You actually won't see the fallback mesh. Uh, this has happened a lot in projects uh, where I'll create blueprints and turn things on and off. And uh, as long as you provide uh, enough memory here, uh, it will load the mesh in its entirety and you won't see any weird pop on artifacts. Okay. All right, sweet. So that kind of covers it for static meshes. Um, I hope that answers some questions that you guys may have about what static meshes are. Uh, they're completely static. They don't move. They don't do anything special. They're just pretty much 3D artwork that are that's shown in your scene. Okay, so let's move forward to skeletal meshes. Okay, so here we are in Blender, and I just want to show you the rig really quick. Um, this isn't a rigging tutorial. It's mostly just, you know, encompassing some of the back-end stuff. That may happen with yeah, character rigs and bones and things like that inside of Blender. So uh, one thing to mention, uh, some prerequisites here. Uh, Blender actually uses bones uh, instead of joints. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to look at this um, rig, you can see that in most, uh, in most software, the joint is drawn as just a, sp a sphere 
and then you would have a child joint and it would actually from the parent to the child create this connection and draw in this bone uh, well not real that doesn't really happen in blender you actually just draw the whole bone and uh, the the actual bone itself has a tail length property uh, so if we were to go into here uh, you can see there is a length for the tail and that's what actually draws the length of it um, so this is nice because you can do things like bendy bones inside of blender where the bones can actually deform and and do kind of cool shapes um, whereas in Maya, that's just joints, uh, in Cinema 4D, that's just joints, um, then it's just a parent-child relationship, and the bone is just drawn in the viewport to show you the relationship. The bone itself doesn't actually have any properties. Uh, I know that may sound weird to um, some beginners, but just something to note, you may not hear that um, from other places, so I just wanted to tell you that here. Okay, so let's go back to uh, object mode here. And uh, again, in Blender, you can tab into uh, what's called pose mode. And this is how you would actually do your animation. Uh, you would select a position and you would set a keyframe. And the more times you do that, you basically have an animation at the end of that, um, at the end of that work. So uh, what we're going to do to, in order to export this for Unreal Engine, we're just going to select everything here in the viewport in object mode. And I'm going to come down to Auto Rig Pro. Uh, if you use the mouse wheel here, you can slide up and down uh, on the sidebar, which is really nice, super handy. Uh, let me turn on my screencast keys one more time uh, and actually move this out so you can read it. So if I scroll up to, this is going to bug me that it's like right over top here. Okay. So if I scroll up to Auto Rig Pro, and then I scroll down, there's an export setting here. So with everything selected, um, I'm just going to head and hit, and hit uh, export FBX. And we have some options here. So this is a different dialog box than the file export FBX. You can see right here, Auto Rig Pro has its own FBX script um, that will help us uh, a lot. <laughs> so this just makes things easier, makes your life easier. Um, earlier in the video, I showed you that the forward axis needed to be negative X, Z up, sorry, the up axis needed to be Z, and then uh, X, Y for the primary and secondary bones on the export. But uh, if you use AutoRig Pro, I'm going to go ahead and overwrite this white Gundam file here. I'm going to choose Unreal Engine, Humanoid, and you can check the uh, rig here. So it has some validation settings, which are super nice and then you can click fix rig and it will say hey we uh, fixed some of these things for you but everything here is just fine uh, i'm going to use selected objects only export twist twist amount one uh, this is nice because in blender um, most of the time it's in centimeters and so uh, you can do times 100 units to export this out um, into unreal engine uh, i'm going to go ahead and say rename for unreal Mannequin axis checked, uh, add IK bones is checked. I'm not going to bake any animations because I don't have any animations. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, leave all of these at default. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, export this. So I failed to mention, uh, sorry about this, one of the big reasons to use AutoRig Pro, if not the only reason to use AutoRig Pro, is that it has a template for the UE5 mannequin. Uh, so you can see all the bones that are placed here using this smart um, Auto Rig Pro smart tooltip here. Basically, you would select all your meshes, you would click get selected objects, and it will walk you through the process. And there's a template in there for the UE5 mannequin. And so when you export, everything just kind of works. And once we uh, bring this in, I can show you some really cool things that we can do with this. So um, let's waste no time and go ahead and import the white Gundam. And what I'm going to do here is in this skeleton, um, I am going to use the SK underscore mannequin. And so this is the UE5 mannequin. This is the UE4 mannequin. Uh, don't get those confused. You can see it's under game characters, mannequin meshes. Uh, I'm just going to use the 
mannequin skeleton because I know the export from Auto Rig Pro renamed everything. Uh, it has the same bones, the weighting's proper, and we can just utilize that skeleton instead of creating a duplicate and having another version of a skeleton that's exactly the same as the mannequin. Uh, the reason why you want to do all this is just because you can use the same animations that you did on the mannequin and just replace the mesh. So you can share a lot of that animation data, control rigs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it's a great idea to do that in summary. <laughs> so let's go ahead uh, and create new materials. Um, and actually let me just import the textures as well. Uh, so all of this should be good. All of uh, this stuff should be just default. No animations at this time. And we're going to go ahead and import all. Okay, so that didn't take long. Uh, we had a small warning, uh, but nothing to worry about there. And so you can see that it grabbed um, our meshes, but uh, only imported the base color. So let me just uh, add one more texture into our project. Okay, so we have our final texture. Uh, there's one thing I need to do to this texture. I need to just tell uh, Unreal Engine that this is a uh, texture that is only used for information, uh, linear color information. So I don't want to have an sRGB curve on this. Uh, so what I do, what I love to do is just set this compression settings to masks uh, and it will fix all of that for me because all the information is being stored in the red channel, uh, the blue channel, and the green channel. So those all um, act as the metallic and roughness uh, for the model and ambient occlusion. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit save and open up this material really quick and just drag this in. Uh, red will be ambient occlusion. We'll do metallic and roughness and it looks like i have uh got those backwards so blue is metallic green is roughness uh red is ambient occlusion and we'll hit save okay so let's take a look at what we have here um i'm gonna go ahead and i like to do this just to create um some you know separation between these assets i'll have a materials folder and using control shift in i can create a new folder and call this textures and this way I can just keep everything nice and organized and now you can see we have an asset that's called skeletal mesh and physics asset um, and we don't have a skeleton uh, well why is that um, the reason we don't have a skeleton is because if I double click on the skeletal mesh and click on the skeleton here uh, we pop back over to the UE5 mannequin, and this is great. Like I said, everything is named exactly the same. This hierarchy is the exact same hierarchy um, that's shown in the Gundam model. Uh, so everything here under skeleton tree will match perfectly. Uh, so we can reuse all those animations, which is amazing. It's amazing. Uh, I used to think that this wasn't the way to go, and... I don't know why I ever thought that because if you have a nice template to start from, you might as well use it, right? Um, why not? So that's what we're going to do essentially. So you can see if I just drag this into the viewport, um, the scale and everything from blender carried over nicely. Uh, apparently I didn't know this, but the Gundams are like 18 meters tall, I believe. So that's the uh, scale that I've set everything to in Blender, and you can see that um, our scale from both of these objects came over uh, nicely. Really, really nice. Okay, so let's do something kind of fun and interesting just for a, an extra bonus uh, for this chapter, or I guess you could call this introduction, whatever you want to call this video. Um, I just want to show the, some of the beginners and some of the people who are just getting into Unreal Engine uh, the power of reutilizing the same skeleton for the mannequin um, what we can do now is create a playable character um, so we can actually run around this city as a Gundam okay so there's a few prerequisites here that we would need uh, a, a basic knowledge or understanding of blueprints 
Um, but I'll try to walk you through everything and explain as we go along. Um, but there's a, there's a decent amount of stuff to cover here. So, uh, the reason why everything just kind of works, uh, I'm in the small city level, uh, if you're following along is because the framework is already set up here under world settings. And if you don't have that, it's under window, uh, world settings and, uh, the framework in Unreal Engine with blueprints is it's pretty genius. Uh, it makes life really simple and modular. Um, so the the actual game mode is just set to BP underscore city sample. And um, I'm going to go ahead and try and uh, turn the volume down a little bit. So hopefully you guys don't get um, flooded with all kinds of crazy audio. But as I jump into the game, you can see that, uh, that the scale in Unreal Engine is just... Uh, incredible like it's just absolutely amazing uh, it looks exactly how you would think it would look if you were standing uh, under a Gundam uh, and I've actually wanted to prototype as a side note a, a, a game where you would run around as a third person and kind of control um, these giant robots fighting I think there was a PlayStation 2 game uh, if you remember that game uh, leave it in the comment section below uh, where you were like a person, but you were actually controlling a large mech. Uh, I think that's just super awesome. A super awesome idea. So the reason why this all works is because this game override uh, is setting all of these variables here. So our default pawn, which is the character we're running around as, is set to the city sample player. And if I browse to that, you can see um, that it's our character here. And we have some logic to, you know, manipulate and run all over the city with. Um, our HUD is just set to the base class of HUD. Uh, the player controller class. Uh, this is all set up as well. Um, this has some logic in here for the city sample. It sets a lot of different variables and dependencies up for you. Uh, and then we also have the game state class, which... Uh, has a decent amount of logic as well that's kind of setting everything up. So you can create a framework where everything's talking together and it's all modular and you can you can actually just replace this stuff, which is what we're going to do now. So if you go to content, right click and go to add import content and then add feature or content pack, you can choose the third person uh, character content pack. And so I already have that imported and it's under third person blueprints and we have a BP underscore third person character, which this blueprint class uh, is a pawn class and uh, has the actual mannequin in it. So this is nice because we have the same skeleton as this mannequin. So let's go ahead and duplicate this really quick. So right click duplicate and we're going to call this Gundam BP underscore Gundam. Uh, character okay and make sure you double click on the gundam character and what we're going to do is replace the skeletal mesh with our gundam and it's massive <laughs> and it looks really wonky here and uh, we're going to dive into that first because yeah that's super distracting so our animation blueprint class if we were to look at the folder here um, the animation blueprint class is set to ABP, which is a prefix for animation blueprint underscore Quinn. Um, so what I did was I just right clicked on it, duplicated and did the same type of thing, ABP underscore Gundam. And uh, what was causing the problem to happen was um, control rig is amazing, by the way, but uh, it's not actually detecting the feet on the floor properly for us. And, um, this is kind of out of the scope to jump into the control rig for the Gundam here uh, of this video. But if you guys want to do some co co really cool control rig videos, man, control rig is, is insane. It's so good. Um, but yeah, let's just go ahead and save that. And if we jump back into our, um, I believe I just minimized it, our BP underscore Gundam character, we're going to just throw our animation blueprint Gundam into this uh, slot right here. So we have it selected and there we go. So um, that fixes up everything for us with the uh, control rig and the feet not hitting the ground properly. 
and for the uh, the camera boom, um, this is something that you could set up in the construction script so that you could manipulate some of these variables uh, in the editor. And let's go ahead and set that up because I find this to be um, really easy if you use a construction script. So uh, if, if you don't know, the construction script is something that will run in editor. So you can create variables, expose them uh, as public variables, and edit them inside of the editor um, so you can test things out. So I'm just going to get the camera boom. Uh, I think if I just go ahead and type length, I can get the target arm length here. And uh, actually, I don't need to get that. I just want to set that target arm length. So there's a difference between getting something and setting something in terms of variables. And uh, we just want to set the actual length uh, in the construction script. Uh, we also want to set the offset. Okay, so we want to set our, I believe it's called socket offset. Uh, let me check on that really quick. Uh, nope, it's actually the target offset. My bad. Well, so let's say set target offset. And we're going to connect this as well. And we're going to create some variables here by right clicking, promoting it to variables. Um, and this will allow us to change these in the editor as long as we turn on these eyeballs right here. Okay. And you could set the category here to something like, uh, cam boom. I don't know. You could, <laughs> you could name it whatever you want. Um, and what this will do is when we compile and save this and we, uh, browse to this in the content browser and drag it into our editor, we'll actually have, let me drag this off, go to our details panel and under cam boom, this is our category. We can change this here in the editor now. So like, let's figure out a target length that works. Let's maybe, let's maybe do like 2,500 and we get a representation of what that is going to look like. And we can pin this preview if we want. So we're going to say 2,500 and then maybe, I don't know, 500, 800. And so that will kind of move our camera up. You can see um, how this is all working. And this is the, uh, the actual target pivot point is right here. So I don't know. We'll try that. Okay, so 2,500 and 1,200. And what we can do now is just come back into our variables and let's set that as the default. So that will give us a nice like starting place. Okay. And we can always tweak it. So let me just grab our test and delete that because what we're going to do is use the world settings to just go ahead and spawn that in for us. So I'm going to go ahead and try and search for this BP underscore third person game mode. And uh, if we were to look at this again and double click on it, this game mode, it just sets the variables for us as long as any other variables that we want. We can, we can do all kinds of stuff. We can store all kinds of things into this class, different variables, different logic, talk to different things. Uh, you can automate things and set these up, but this is just kind of a container. It's being used as a container for these variables right now. And uh, we'll go ahead and close this real quick. And for our default uh, pawn, we're just going to search for Gundam. And then we'll hit play. Cool. So that spawns us into the, uh, the level. And we can move around as our Gundam character. And you can see uh, we probably need to be moving like 10 times faster <laughs> as this Gundam. Uh, so all of that's done in our... Uh, movement component in blueprint, but you can see things are working, uh, which is really cool. Uh, we're going to get a warning here and, uh, this is basically trying to access some, uh, variables. Um, for the time being, you don't need to really worry about this, but, um, if you really wanted to fix these things, you would want to actually call them and fix them in the, uh, in the character blueprints. Okay, so uh, let's wrap this up a little bit and go into our Gundam character and let's go into our movement component and we're just going to set uh, some of these variables. So the walking speed, I'm going to just 
put uh, times 10 and then the braking de deceleration walking uh, again I'm just gonna do times 10 uh, so basically when we let up on the WSAD keys, uh, it's going to stop immediately. It's going to have the braking deceleration uh, set correctly. And then there's also um, acceleration that we probably want to mess with. Um, so this max acceleration, I'm going to go ahead and um, set this to like, let's just do times 10. We'll just put another one one more zero in there uh with that acceleration what it's going to do is hopefully it's going to get us up to speed immediately when we hit the button and it's not going to slowly move us up to our max speed yeah that actually feels that feels much better so now you can see when we let up we actually break um yeah so now we can run around as a giant gundam <laughs> and create a gundam game right <laughs> how awesome would that be um, yeah, so, uh, I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop this video here. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, introduction to static meshes and skeletal meshes and the fun, uh, context that I tried to put in here just to, uh, give you an idea about what the difference is between the two. Really static meshes, they're just there as artwork and they can't really be interacted with, um, the skeletal meshes, they can have bones, uh, control rigs, uh, animations. So many things can actually be attached to those skeletal meshes. Uh, sadly, they cannot be nanite. Um, so if we were to fly over here and go into um, nanite visualization, triangles, you can see that this is not a nanite mesh. Hopefully in the future we could have potential, you know, almost unlimited polygons for skeletal meshes. We'll see what happens in the future. There is a way around this though. If you remember the Valley of the Ancients demo, they actually did something really impressive. They attached nanite objects to the bones of the skeletal mesh. And you could do that super simply um, by, uh, let me just create a, uh, let me go back up to, our Gundam folder, skeletal mesh. I'm going to create a new blueprint. Uh, yeah, new blueprint. And go to actor BP underscore SKM uh, Gundam. And so what you can do in here is throw in your skeletal mesh. And let's say we had some kind of high polygon uh, static mesh. Uh, you can put that under here. And uh, I don't know. Heck. It could be anything really. Let's uh, let's see if we can find something really quick. Sure, this freeway. <laughs> um, whatever this sign is. But under this parent socket, you can parent um, meshes to a certain socket. So like if you wanted this to be on the head, uh, you can put this on the head. And that's what they did with the Valley of the Ancients demo. They they had a very simplified skeletal mesh and they used a uh, masked material, the opacity mask, and they made the skeletal mesh invisible and just socketed all of the nanite meshes to the skeleton. Uh, and it was, and it worked great, you know, cause it was non-deforming geometry. It was just a bunch of hard surface objects, which would be great with a Gundam character. You could just attach um, all of those to your bones and you could have a very high, highly detailed character mesh that you're piloting, uh, in your game. Okay. So, um, I know I said I was done <laughs> with this video, but I wanted to leave you with that extra tip. Uh, I hope that helps you guys get started into unreal engine. I, I hope I demystified some of these things and, uh, gave you a little bit more context about what skeletal meshes are and what static meshes are. So, uh, I'm going to stop rambling and we'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.